Well, before we jump into uh, this material that we have planned this afternoon, I, I, I want to make sure that, uh, or I want to go back to this morning's lesson for a second and, 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 and make sure we understood one thing that I said could be true. Did anybody catch or follow when I said that maybe or could it be that God changed his entire plan for bringing Jesus to this earth because of the mistake these people made? Uh, because I, I, I've never thought this before in my life. It never even dawned on me. But God really did not want them to have a king. He told them, you don't want a king. Uh, now, maybe in his grand providence, in his way, he knew they would go ahead and have a king, but it almost seems like God originally had not planned for any king. David would never be in the pages of the scripture had these people not requested a king, and God called it evil. Now, I'm saying that in part because I want us to make sure that we think that through, because I may not be close to right. I've never heard that before in my life, but it seems like it's saying that. But if it's true, the amazing part of God is that He's willing for the sake of saving people He loves to even alter His course of action. That, that's how much God loves us. And that brings me back to the little phrase that was made that Samuel made, that God will go ahead and call you His people for His name's sake. For His name's sake. For the honor or the glory of His name. Now, that's a point I want to emphasize because honor, in the sight of God, honor is a giant word. We don't talk about it. I bought a book the other day so I could see what this person was saying about it. But one of the things we'll learn in David's life as we go through his life is that more than any other character in Scripture that I know of, David remains a man of honor. Uh, so, a, so a guy will come along late in the game and tell David, I killed Saul, thinking that he will get great reward. And David will not know that he's telling a lie. David's question was, how dare you think you could get by with touching or destroying the Lord's anointed? And David has him what? Has him killed. Isn't that amazing? It's David's sense of honor. It's God's honor of his own name that would cause him to redeem these people who had rejected him in this king deal. Now, we're going to emphasize this thing of honor all the way through the study of David, but it also appears today in today's lesson in a sense. Maybe I'm stretching it a bit, but I think it's there. The honor, I don't know what honor means except doing it right. Or the idea of honor is if I honor my father and my mother, which is a command, God expects me to honor them the best I possibly can, to recognize their name, to recognize their value, to recognize I wouldn't be here without it. God demands honor all the way through. Now, He does not demand perfection. Uh, we've always felt like He demanded perfection, what he does do is forgive our imperfection. He doesn't demand perfection. He demands that we honor him, that we pay attention to him, that we recognize him, that we trust him, that we obey him. Uh, but we don't do it perfectly, so he forgives our imperfection. But it's, there's an honor thing in here. So we looked at Abraham last week, and Abraham is held forth in the book of Hebrews as one who stayed the course by this thing that we call faith. And I got really excited last week because I said I can identify with Abraham 
more than I can identify with Noah. All I know is Noah did everything exactly as God told him to do. But I scratch my head and think, I don't know how many people do that. I don't know how many people can do that, do everything as God told them to do. We're not, we're not very good. But I get to Abraham, and Abraham is told in Genesis chapter 12 to leave, go to a land that God will show him, and he gets up and goes because he believes in the promise of God. But we saw him getting to Canaan land last week, in chapter 12, and there's a drought there, a famine there. It'll happen more than once, by the way. Even in Canaan land, the most fertile land apparently in the world, uh, it happens more than once because what happened in the days of Joseph, when Joseph was already in Egypt and on the throne? Why did his brothers have to come? Because there was a famine there. So he has to leave in Genesis chapter 12, the promised land, and go to Egypt. And when he gets into Egypt, this man of great faith becomes what? Scared. <laughs> he becomes afraid. He, be, he, he can't... Sarah, it, it, you know, you're pretty nice looking still. And if he sees you, the king sees you, they're going to kill me. And so he concocts a plan. Well, we get through all that and we come to chapter 13. I, I think chapter 13 is an interesting chapter. We've loved to teach it. But to me, it has something to do with uh, faith. It may even have something to do with honor, by the way. Chapter 13, verse 1, looking at Abraham. So Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev with his wife and everything he had, and Lot went with him. Verse 2, Abraham became, had become very wealthy in livestock, in silver, and in gold. Uh, how did that happen? How did he get very wealthy in livestock, and in silver, and in gold? All right, Egyptian, Pharaoh gave him a bunch to get rid of him. <laughs> and... But in, in the grand scheme of things, what did God promise Abraham? I'll bless you. I, I, I'll make your name great. I, so, so is God keeping His promise? Is Abraham convinced that God's keeping His promise? Well, he is convinced and he gets unconvinced. He's convinced and he gets unconvinced. But watch what happens in this chapter. Verse 5. Now Lot, who was moving about with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. Uh, wonder how Lot got those. You know, this old, this old adage of running around with the right people, running around with the right people, versus running around with the wrong people, it makes a big difference in your life. So we tell our children, choose your friends what? Yeah, very, very carefully, wisely. Because it makes a difference who you run around with. His association with Abraham is a pretty good deal for him, is it not? I mean, he, he gets blessed along with Abraham, so he has a lot of flocks and herds. But the land they're in could not support them while they stayed together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to stay together. And so quarreling arose between Abram's herdsmen and the herdsmen of Lot. Is that uncommon? Or can I identify with that one too? I can identify with that really, really well, can't you? Have you ever seen anybody quarrel over possessions? It happens all the time. And seldom do you go through an inheritance thing that people don't quarrel over possessions. Even when you think they would never. Uh, it, they quarrel over things. That's the power that things have over us at times. And so they're quarreling. Abraham's herdsmen, Lot's herdsmen, they quarrel. Uh, verse 8, So Abraham said to Lot, Let's not have any quarreling between you and me, between your herdsmen, mine, we're brothers. 
Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Now that's, that's kind of an interesting way of settling the problem, isn't it? Why don't you just take what you want? If you go that direction, I'll go the other direction. Just take what you want. Uh, now, I'm too selfish for that deal. At times, I get too selfish for that kind of deal. Because I kind of feel like it's my one chance. You know, i got two brothers. Uh, I know how they are. Uh, I better get it while I can. You know, because there won't be any second chances. There won't be a redo, okay, like I said this morning. There won't be a do-over. Uh, and I tell them that all the time. I, you know, it's, uh, I said, look, I'm in control. You guys haven't got a, you haven't got a, got a, got a word. You know, I'm taking care of this. <laughs> and, and we laugh about it, but it's, they're both bigger than I. <laughs> and so they'll settle it in the end. But, but how can Abraham be so unselfish at this moment? That's the point of this whole chapter. How can Abraham be so unselfish at this moment? How can he have no concern? Take whatever you want, Lot. I'll take the other. How can he act like that? All right. All right. Now, here it is. Here's what Gary's saying. Because at this moment in his life, he's convinced about one primary promise. And that's who made the promise? God made the promise. And the promise said what? I'll take care of you in a really big way. I'm going to take care of you in a really good way. So what does he care? What does he care which land he gets? What does he care which direction Lot goes? In the sense that, look, I've, I'm, I'm, doing, I'm doing work for God. God's going to take care of me. God's going to bless me. So you take whatever you want. What Abraham is doing in this chapter is a matter of faith. It's a matter of honoring God in what God said. Every time you live by true trust and follow by true faith, you're honoring God. He, he's making a statement on God's behalf right now. Now, you can read the next verse. What does Lot choose? Well, Doc said the best. Now, if I were in Lot's shoes, and I didn't know any more than Lot apparently knows, guess what I'd have chosen? I might have said, Uncle, do you really mean that? <laughs> Are you really serious? I'd really like to have that good land over there. Now, the only problem is, one thing we need to remember is, Seldom does selfishness work out right. Everybody understand that? Seldom does selfishness really have a good ending to it. It almost always has the other ending. So he chooses the fertile plain of Jordan. What are the, what are the major cities in the fertile plain of Jordan? Sodom and Gomorrah. And... What's life like in those cities? It's terrible in what way? Morally. Morally, it is absolutely bankrupt. It's absolutely bankrupt. And I know in our world today, now listen to me very carefully as I say this, I get in real trouble. I got in trouble umpteen times at the university for this stance. Uh, but I know in our world today that homosexuality is very common. And it is accepted at least to the point it's a forced acceptance on the part of everyone. Am I right? It's in our school systems almost everywhere. It, it's, it's, it's forced. I've always maintained, I've always maintained that 
I have nothing against that particular persuasion. I'm not an enemy. I'm not bitter. I don't fight you. The position of God is He loves. And all I ever say to the people who come to me, and I've had, I've had, I've had students walk into my office, close the door, and say, you need to know this about me. And I say, so? What next? I said, may I tell you that it's the practice thereof that is when it becomes sin. You can have every feeling you want to have in this world. It's the practice thereof that becomes sin. Well, in Sodom and Gomorrah, all those ages ago, it was the practice thereof. Am I making sense? It, it was so morally bankrupt that it was filled even to the point of homosexuality. Now, what will ultimately happen to Sodom and Gomorrah by God's design? He's going to make crispies out of them. He's going to wipe them out, but he's going to do it by raining down fire and brimstone so everything gets scorched, burned, destroyed, killed. Uh, now, if I said what I just said, in any public, public venue, what's going to happen to me? I'm going to be scorched too. That's exactly right. I'm going to be scorched. I am not saying that you're my enemy. I, please don't... I don't I, I'm not even condemning. I'm condemning the practice thereof. I'm condemning the practice thereof. Uh, Lot chooses selfishly. He ends up in the worst cities in the Old Testament and they're going to get burned up. And he almost gets burned up with them. Uh, in between time, in between time, they're going to get raided by enemy kings. Guess who, who's going to get hauled away? Lot and his family are going to get hauled away. Who might rescue poor Lot? Well, there's nobody else. Well, Abraham hears about it. Abraham is not a fighting man that we know anything about. And yet Abraham will strap on swords and he'll take his men and go get his nephew because he's his nephew. You see the honor in that? I'm going to do it because it's the right thing to do. I'm going to extract it. Before Sodom and Gomorrah are burned up, who does God talk to about burning them up. Abraham. What does Abraham do? He tries to bargain. Why would he want to bargain with this? Because for me, for me, I might just take a look at that and say, now that's the best idea I've heard in a long time. You know? That's the best idea I've ever heard. You know? Well, why would Abraham be so intent on saying, God, if I could find 50 over there that didn't think like those people thought, would you save them? And God will say what? Yeah, I'll do that. Well, I've got I to gotta lower that number down a little bit. <laughs> if I could find 40 or 30 or 10 or whatever, whatever those numbers are, uh, yeah, I'll do that. But he couldn't find them. Who was he bargaining for? Who was he trying to help? his nephew Lot and his family. Because Abraham has this sense of love, this sense of loyalty, this sense of honor, and he has this amazing faith that God's in control of all things. And he has a conversation with God like few people have ever had in all the Bible. Like few people ever had. Now, how does this story end? Well, Abraham, Lot takes that fertile plain, Sodom and Gomorrah. He chose the whole plain of Jordan, it says, in verse 11. And he set out toward the east. The two men parted company. Abraham lived in Canaan while Lot lived among the cities. Pitched his tent there. Now, the men of Sodom were wicked and were sinning greatly against God. We don't, we'll only learn later just how badly they were sinning. 
I, I hope you don't misinterpret me today, what I said. I do not. I, I don't care what your background is or what your persuasion is. If you come and talk to me, I'll never flinch. I'll never flinch. But I will tell you every single time, it's the practice thereof. If you came and told me you had a strong, strong attraction to alcohol, I'd say so does that, so a lot of people have at Northside. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Y'all have got to wake up, okay? <laughs> you, you, Don and Ron and Greg, I mean, they have a strong attraction, but not the rest of you, okay? <laughs> so, but I would say, that's okay. May I tell you that the over-practice thereof, the over-practice thereof is what becomes sinful? Everybody making sense out of that? Uh, what, what, what is the difference in that in a man who is attracted to a woman that's not his wife and, and I can say, okay, but if you act upon that, it becomes what? Sin. But I'm telling you, it's the act of it that makes it wrong, wrong, wrong. You all have temptations. It's the act of it, the acting it out. Am I getting deeper in trouble here? It's the acting it out that becomes terrible sin, wrong sin. So, it's the same thing with greed. It's the same thing with everything else. You've got to get a handle on this stuff and not follow through. So Abraham has protected Lot a lot. Pardon the pun, whatever it is. But, uh, after this is all over, look what the Lord said to Abraham. Lift up your eyes from where you are. Look north, south, east, west. All the land you see, I'll give you and your offsprings forever. I'll make your offsprings like the dust of the earth, so that if anyone could count the dust, then your offspring would be counted. Go walk the length, the breadth of the land, for I'm giving to you. So Abraham moved his tents, went to live in the, near the great trees of, near Hebron. What does God do for the man who remains faithful to him? Who acts right? who act, chooses the right course of action because of his faith. What does God do for that person? He blesses him. He keeps his promise. And if I tie that together with what I'm talking about this morning, I think for the person who goes out of their way to control themselves, not act on their impulses, not act on their temptations, but out of faith and honor to God, they try their best to live right. God do, does unbelievable things to try to, to love those people and show Him His love. So it's, it's not perfection. It's not pure feelings on every single thing. It's, not, it's the fact that I stop in the middle of wherever I'm being pulled and say, no, I'm God's. And I want to honor God by doing my best to live this way. And when God sees that, God responds to it. Am I making any sense? And, I, and I'm talking about, Greg, Greg, Doc made an interesting point. He said, you could act like Jesus and not be in Jesus. Now, if I move over into that thing, that, that's exactly right. You could be a good person. You could be one who refrains from, from acting on your impulses. But it's the people who are in Christ who are God's children. In Christ, in the New Testament, in the ultimate form of God's plan is like being an Israelite back in the Old Testament. You're in Christ. And if you're in Christ, for His great namesake, you live so as to honor Him. You don't live perfectly. You can't. 
but His blood will keep on forgiving you if you honor Him with your actions. Your My thoughts aren't always right, but hopefully not every thought turns into an action. Somewhere in there you've got to get a control of it. Abraham lost control in chapter 12 of his thinking. In chapter 13, he stands up like a what? A giant of faith. Uh, man, I'd want to take Lot and knock him around a bit. I'd at least like to slap him a couple of times and say, you know how you got all your money, buddy? You know how you got all your flocks and herds? I, 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 that's kind of how Ken operates. But, but not Abraham. Abraham says, just do what you need to do. I'll, God will take care of me. That's, what, that's got to be at the heart of his thing. God will take care of me. It's a matter of you and I as God's children in Christ trying to live with a sense of honor before God. Uh, I don't do certain things I might tend to do or I do certain things that I might not want to do because I'm God's and I want to honor his great name. Uh, and he does the same thing. He honors us. Kind of wild, isn't it? But it's really, really to the heart of who we are if we ever get there, if we ever truly understand it and start living it. It's the heart of when God opens his storehouse of blessings, I think. Paul gives us some very good analogies in there. You know, the Roman house that describes the ability to do it. Right. Yeah, and Paul will make that statement over and over again in his writings. It's Christ living in me. It's, it's Christ working through me. You know, so it's... Okay. I'm five minutes past. I'm, I'm, I'm getting bad about that. I, gotta, I, I promise. So. <laughs>